A reading from page 28 of Between the World and Me. A year after I watched the boy with the small eyes pull out a gun, my father beat me for letting another boy steal from me. Two years later, he beat me for threatening my ninth grade teacher. Not being violent enough could cost me my body. Being too violent could cost me my body. We could not get out. I was a capable boy, intelligent, well-liked, but powerfully afraid. And I felt vaguely wordless that for a child to be marked off for such a life, to be forced to live in fear was a great injustice. And what was the source of this fear? What was hiding behind the smokescreen of streets and schools? And what did it mean that number two pencils, conjugations without context, Pythagorean theorems, handshakes and head nods were the difference between life and death? Were the curtains drawing down between the world and me? This week on On Books, I want to inspire you to read Between the World and Me, a book by Ta Nahasi Coates. Uh, it came out in 2015. I just read it in the past year, and I find it extremely eye-opening, and it's, it sent me down a path of reading and learning and watching films around the topic of America, black men and women in America, understanding our past, understanding my place in all of this, uh, questioning what privilege means, just a lot of really big questions. And so in this episode, I want to bring you a little bit of, I mean, I, th- I think to bring you the book is one thing. And at the end, uh, in a few minutes, we're going to have uh, Tana Coates read from the book, starting from the beginning. So we'll do a little bit of that. But before that, I want to frame, you know, who he is, w- you know, why this book's important and what it meant to me and the questions that I've been asking. Because I think if you can see it through the lens of the changes that it has had in me, that it may awaken something in you. That would be my hope is that it may open up something in you to start asking similar questions. No matter who you are or what country you live in, I think there's lessons in here that, I mean, they're definitely American questions, but they reverberate to all sides of the globe. ta Coates is an author and journalist. He's also the recipient of, I think he's a MacArthur Fellow, which, which basically means he's a badass, smart dude. Uh, he's a national correspondent for The Atlantic, where he writes about culture, society, political issues. One of my favorite, and I think one of his most profound uh, pieces that he wrote in The Atlantic is called The Case for Reparations, and I couldn't more, I couldn't, I couldn't hi- more highly recommend it to you. At the end of this episode, I'm gonna put some follow-up reading, and this will be one of them. He's also written three books, uh, Between the World and Me, which came out in 2015, but before that, The Struggle, The Beautiful Struggle, uh, which was a memoir about his coming of age in West Baltimore, and most recently, We Were Eight Years in Power, which came out in 2017. Reading from the the side of the book here, when you kind of buy the book, you open it up, and on the side, the pamphlet, it says a few words. I'm just going to read that to you, just to frame the, the sense of the book. So, in a profound work that pivots from the biggest questions about American history and ideals to the most innate concerns of a father and his son, ta Coates offers a powerful new framework for understanding our nation's history and current crisis. Americans have built an empire on the idea of race, a falsehood that damages us all, but falls most heavily on the bodies of black women and men. Bodies exploited through slavery and segregation, and today threatened, locked up, and murdered out of all proportion. What is it like to inhabit a black body and find a way to live within it? And how can we all honestly reckon with this fraught history and free ourselves from its burden? So this book, Between the World and Me, is is his attempt to answer these questions. And the way he does it is the book is written as a letter to his adolescent son. That's the whole, you know, throughout it, it's this long letter that he's, he's writing. Um, as a book, it's not quite that long. It's about 140 pages. Uh, and, it, and it follows his story of, you know, of coming up, of growing up in America, in West Baltimore, and you know the things that he wishes that his son would know coming into the world, the things that he needs to know, the things that he needs to tell him. Lately, I've been thinking a lot about privilege and what it means to be privileged. Uh, I think we all have some sort of privilege. It's not just a, a black, white issue. 
um, privilege in some ways is the the luxury or the things that you have that you don't need to think about anymore, right? So if we're, I mean, if you're able-bodied and, and you don't need a wheelchair to walk around, then you don't need to think about where the wheelchair ramp, wheel, the wheelchair ramps are, right? That's not a thing that you think about when you go and you stay at an Airbnb or you go to a restaurant. You have the privilege of not having to worry about this. And similarly, there's a privilege that comes with being white you know, myself being white in America. And because I don't have to think about all of the benefits that I was given when I was born, born into, and that really stemmed throughout my life, uh, it's hard to see them. They're invisible. Um, This book for me, as well as some of the recommended reading around this book, has, you know, just begun to open my eyes. Uh, I would use the term woke, but I don't really like that term so much because I, I don't think you get to a stage of being woke and then you're, it's it, you, you're like, I'm woke, I'm up, <laughs> I'm up, I'm going out to go get some uh, to get some food at the supermarket, I'm awake. Uh, I think it's a constant awakening, you know, and that's why I come, you know, humbly having, you know, read about a dozen books, but still never being able to fully comprehend or understand or empathize in the way that I might hope that I could reach, you know, that level of awakening. So it's a constant awakening for me. And I think that's what has been drilled throughout this book is just, you can see if you look at it with your own privilege, I mean, at least for me, you know, I can look at it with my own privilege, just, just like lines like here in this line on, you know, page 19, the story of just being in a situation where, someone pulls a gun on you. I've never had that happen to me. So he writes, the boy with small eyes reached into his ski jackets and pulled out a gun. I recall it in the slowest motion as though in a dream. There the boy stood with the gun brandished, which he slowly untucked, tucked, and then untucked once more. And in his small eyes, I saw a surging rage that could in an instant erase my body. So he goes on to say, he, has, he, he didn't need to shoot because he had affirmed my place in the order of things. This situation, this idea of the order of things, I, I don't know. It's, it's hard to kind of imagine my order of things and how I got to where I am without thinking about all of the privilege all of the people that made it possible, you know, and I challenge you because we all have a story of how we got to where we are, you know, I mean, already I've only read to you two pieces from this book and, and one, you can imagine the order of things growing up in a high school where there's an order that life and death schools versus street, right. Uh, could be pulled on you at any moment. You're, you're, you're trying to hedge your bet to live in, in that existence. Another, situation of privilege is just, you know, the, the sad opening that I started with, which, um, of his father, you know, uh, beating him down for being stolen from these kind of things. Um, I try to imagine that in contrast to making my own privilege visible because those again are two situations I didn't have to deal with. Right. So, um, I feel like that's recounted over and over and through this book. And, you know, this book may just be one window to that world or to a world that opens privilege in your eyes. Um, and there's plenty of, you know, I, 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 there's plenty of windows to that space. And, uh, you know, I'm the reason this I'm recommending this book here is I think it's quite readable and relatable and under, you know, and, uh, I don't know, say so like, uh, approachable, you know, as, as a piece of reading, um, and, and beautifully well-written to like it's poetry for 140 pages. Um, so yeah, <laughs> but I challenge you to think about the people and the circumstances throughout your life that maybe gave you some kind of leverage or privilege to which you're resting on. I mean, for me, I've just had so many, you know, countless situations, you know, not only from having parents that love me and, you know, su- somewhat supportive schoolmates. I mean, I, they never got a gun pulled on me. Maybe I got punched once, but whatever. <laughs> Sometimes people ask me if I've ever been in a fight and I'll say, I've never been in a fight, but I got punched once, but that, whatever. Uh, and 
Um, and you know, into other things, like I was awarded a scholarship uh, for something in, you know, for my master's. And I, before that, you know, how did I get the scholarship? Well, I had enough money to do some independent research, you know, on the music industry and, and royalties coming out of my undergraduate. And how did I get into undergraduate? Well, you know, I could trace that back to, for me, I don't know. I think it was just, you know, having my parents help pay a little bit for college and pay for tutors and that kind of thing. Um, as well as just having friends that were really good examples. I think that that's one really, really powerful takeaway in life is surrounding yourself with people who are good <laughs> and smart. They say that you are the sum, this is my favorite quote, that you are the sum of the five people that you spend the most time with. So you are the sum of the five people that you spend the most time with. I told that to my friend uh, Bird recently. <laughs> and after I said it, he goes, uh-oh, <laughs> right? So I'm going to let Ta-Nehisi Coates uh, read from the book now. We're going to do the first few pages of the book. And uh, after that, we'll chat a little bit more and I'll give you some links to follow up and continue uh, asking questions and learning so that we can all learn uh, for ourselves to understand our own privilege and also, you know, the place of American history, understanding our own history as Americans. Um, there's a quote, just one last thing I'll say is, um, this book was inspired, so ta Coates, Coates, he, he says that he was inspired by a similar book uh, by James Baldwin. So James Baldwin had written uh, a book called The Fire Next Time in the 60s, I believe, which was uh, a letter to his son, not a son, to his nephew, right? Uh, and in that book, it was, it was kind of of a similar vein of, of you know, awakening and, and sharing with him these, these kind of stories. Um, but uh, James Baldwin has this quote in a movie that just came out called I Am Not Your Negro. And he says, the story of the Negro in America is the story of America. And I think that's really powerful because we are still you know, turn on the news. We are still dealing with these issues of race and segregation and privilege and underprivileged. And I think that white people, a lot of white people seem to think that, you know, what's wrong? Everything's good, right? You know, because they don't see it because you can't see it. And so we go on living like there is no problem, right? And, uh, you know, slavery was this thing that was, I don't know, hundreds of years ago, right? That's not true, but that's kind of the, the feeling when you walk on the streets, right? Um, but it really wasn't that long ago. You know, it was, it was only, uh, you know, 100, we had 250 years of slavery, right? And then that only last, uh, that ended about 150 years ago, 1865, right? Um, but then after that, we had about 90 years of Jim Crow, 60 years of separate but equal, 35 years of, you know, racist housing policies, which ta Coates talks about in The Case for Respirations, um, and on and on and on, you know, this still goes on till today. So this is not over, and it is something that we can, we, we need to educate ourselves about so that we can really unite the country and unite the world and, and move on. Otherwise, we are stuck, uh, we are stuck on our history as a country. Here's ta Coates reading from Between the World and Me. Last Sunday, the host of a popular news show asked me what it meant to lose my body. The host was broadcasting from Washington, D.C., and I was seated in a remote studio on the far west side of Manhattan. A satellite closed the miles between us, but no machinery could close the gap between her world and the world for which I had been summoned to speak. When the host asked me about my body, her face faded from the screen, and was replaced by a scroll of words written by me earlier that week. The host read these words for the audience, and when she finished, she turned to the subject of my body, although she did not mention it specifically. But by now, I am accustomed to intelligent people asking about the condition of my body without realizing the nature of their request. Specifically, the host wished to know why I felt that white America's progress, or rather, the progress of those Americans who believe they are white, was built on looting and violence. Hearing this, I felt an old and indistinct sadness well up in me. The answer to this question is the record of the believers themselves. The answer is American history. There is nothing extreme in this statement. Americans deify democracy in a way that allows for a dim awareness that they have, from time to time, 
stood in defiance of their God. But democracy is a forgiving God, and America's heresies, torture, theft, enslavement, are so common among individuals and nations that none can declare themselves immune. In fact, Americans, in a real sense, have never betrayed their God. When Abraham Lincoln declared in 1863 that the Battle of Gettysburg must ensure that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth, he was not merely being aspirational. At the onset of the Civil War, the United States of America had one of the highest rates of suffrage in the world. The question is not whether Lincoln truly meant government of the people, but what our country has, throughout its history, taken the political term people to actually mean. In 1863, it did not mean your mother or your grandmother, and it did not mean you and me. Thus, America's problem is not its betrayal of government of the people, but the means by which the people acquired their names. This leads us to another equally important ideal, one that Americans implicitly accept, but to which they make no conscious claim. Americans believe in the reality of race as a defined, indubitable feature of the natural world. Racism, the need to ascribe bone-deep features to people and then humiliate, reduce, and destroy them, inevitably follows from this inalterable condition. In this way, Racism is rendered as the innocent daughter of Mother Nature, and one is left to deplore the middle passage or the trail of tears the way one deplores an earthquake, a tornado, or any other phenomenon that can be cast as beyond the handiwork of men. But race is the child of racism, not the father, and the process of naming the people has never been a matter of genealogy and physiognomy so much as one of hierarchy. Difference in hue and hair is old but the belief in the preeminence of hue and hair, the notion that these factors can correctly organize a society and that they signify deeper attributes which are indelible. This is the new idea at the heart of these new people who have been brought up hopelessly, tragically, deceitfully to believe that they are white. These new people are like us, a modern invention. But unlike us, their new name has no real meaning divorced from the machinery of criminal power. The new people were something else before they were white, Catholic, Corsican, Welsh, Mennonite, Jewish. And if all our national hopes have any fulfillment, then they will have to be something else again. Perhaps they will truly become American and create a nobler basis for their myths. I cannot call it. As for now, it must be said that the process of washing the disparate tribes white, the elevation of the belief in being white, was not achieved through wine tastings and ice cream socials, but rather through the pillaging of life, liberty, labor, and land, through the flaying of backs, the chaining of limbs, the strangling of dissidents, the destruction of families, the rape of mothers, the sale of children, and various other acts meant first and foremost to deny you and me the right to secure and govern our own bodies. All right, I hope that this has inspired you to read Between the World and Me or to read some other things by ta Coates. I'll put some links in the show notes uh, and I'll share those with you. And I, you know, I want to address a question that I, that I hear often and I get often when I speak with, I don't know, people in my family or people back in very white suburban neighborhoods. And when we talk about, you know, the issue of, of slavery, sometimes this issue, this question comes up and says, you know, I didn't own slaves. Why should I be responsible? And I kind of understand where they're coming from. You know, what is the responsibility of someone who is white in America uh, to deal with or to take responsibility for for these questions, right? And the way that I th the way that I think about it is, okay, you are right. You are not responsible for slavery. You are not there, right? You, this was, it was, was a few generations ago, and you know, how could you personally be responsible for it? But you are responsible as a citizen of America for educating yourself. So you are responsible to to stay educated and to share that education so that this never happens again and so that this doesn't continue to perpetuate through our society. That is the education. And, you know, by reading this book and by reading, you know, around, you know, different authors in, the, in this genre uh, and by, by 
by picking up, you know, watching some documentaries and and just learning and educating yourself and having the, these conversations, having these hard conversations. You know, this isn't even easy for me right now to kind of to talk about some of this stuff because it's not the kind of conversation that I necessarily have every single day. Um, but I recognize how important it is to share to share these thoughts and feelings and to share my journey of of, of understanding. And I want to hear more of that, and I want to you know I, I want to encourage people to share more of that. Um, that idea of responsibility with with people who may have abstained from any responsibility at all. The way you know, I heard Tim Wise once once talk about it, um, and he was saying that it's it's as if so. Imagine this: it's as if you just wake up some you know in some world, you wake up some world, and there's all these assets, there's all these like amazing things that you're just born into. Like there's gold and there's gumdrops and everything's great, right? You're just born into all these these assets, the fruits of the people that have come before you. But what you don't notice is that there were loans taken out to give you those assets, right? There were loans. People worked really hard and and when people pass away, right, the assets, all the benefits, but also the loans, the people responsible aren't around anymore, right? So who is there to claim the assets and the loans? Well, it seems as though, in the way he explains this, it seems as though, you know, white people, we tend to we tend to take all the benefits from slavery, right? I mean, this country was born on the backs of millions of people who who struggled and died to bring us to advance us, you know, through innovation, through cotton, through, you know, fighting through the first, you know, the first two world wars, through all of this, right? And so we are benefiting from that because I am now in a position of of power, of uh, living in a school district, you know, a good school district and having really good parents that, you know, are, 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 are can put food on the table, this kind of thing. Um, but there are people who in that exchange were not so lucky and they are still fighting and they have lost, you know, or they're literally starting with a losing hand. And I just think it's, it's, it's our responsibility to educate ourselves and understand more so that we can make sense and hopefully come to an agreement or, uh, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what the solution is, but I just think education is, is the first step at least in many steps ahead of us. All right. I want to thank you for listening to this episode of On Books. Uh, I would encourage you to read Between the World and Me by Ta-Nehisi Coates. Uh, I'm going to put some more links down below or in the show notes, basically, uh, that you can read more books on. So I think uh, The New Jim Crow is another book that I would recommend. Uh, James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time, as well as I have a whole reading list that, uh, that Ta-Nehisi Coates put together of about a dozen books that he would recommend as follow-up reading to the book. So I'll put all of those down in the link. Uh, as far as documentaries, if you haven't seen the 13th, it is a doc- documentary on Netflix. Uh, I would it's about the American prison system and uh, and slavery and its relationship to slavery, and I would I would definitely recommend you watch that as well. All right, this has been another episode of On Books. If you enjoyed this show, you can subscribe on iTunes. It's free, and there's about 52 other books that I have put together to help you really raise your consciousness and education um, around a lot of really important subjects. You can check that out. Um, this book was my number three favorite read of the past year uh, in the next two episodes i'll have my number two and number one so you can check those out as well you can always reach me i'm at chris at on books.com give me a shout out or if you have any thoughts or i don't know give me a correction if there's something that i you know need to need to figure out or work on myself <laughs> i'm always trying to improve myself all right until next time this has been on books <laughs>